Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, and I beseech you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we all speak the same thing, that there be no division among us, that we be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Amen. It's all in the scripture. There are seven warning signs that signal that a church or an individual has left their first love. One, Christ is no longer the center focus in our lives. That's the first indication. Christ is no longer the center focus in there in our lives. And that is so important. The first day, you don't leave the church physically. But spiritually, mentally, they already left. The Bible still here, but their focus is not here. Their focus is not here. They have other interests. So it's already have other interests. It's already have other interests. But keep him first. He's a bless all. He's the one to bless you. You can't bless yourself. If your health goes, you have no way. Your health is your wealth. Your health is your wealth. So you, can't, you don't feel like working, you don't feel like you're not dead. You can't be prosperous. God gave us power to get well. In other words, He gives you strength physically and mentally to uh, obtain a job. I was talking to somebody, they said, You should go to the job without a kitchen, no longer. 
which were aligned with her resume. So things are so, it's rapidly changing. But we as a same God, we've got to remain the same. We don't change whenever we're in the doctor. We don't change because society to do, do this or that. Thing. So, well, this, this is the way they do it. Well, that's fine. But the way we do it here is the way that God instructed uh, our founders to do it. We, we stand on a solid foundation. Two, you neglect the relationship with the Lord and spend less time in prayer, worship, and the Word. What distracts you from these things? What distracts you from spending time in prayer? What distracts you from time in worship and time in the Word of God? Other things. Other things. And you get tired of this, that, and the other. And before you know it, your whole day is going, putting out fires. I call it putting out fires. Problems, situations. Everything arrives and, and you're trying to manage all these things and you find yourself spending no time in prayer or no time in reading the Bible. And these things lead you down a road of destruction. You still come to church, but you lost interest, you lost your focus, you don't pray, you don't read the word. So you find yourself drifting. Look at David said you find yourself drifting. Don't pray anymore, just pray. Don't pray anymore. Well, I would pray, but I'm so busy. That's the first thing that ever can keep you busy. So busy that you can't pray. You know, at night you're so tired, you take a shower, and you lay down and go to sleep. And sometimes you grab your word, you sleep with the Bible in your arms. <laughs> Anybody on the other side of me? Because the day was so full. But sometimes God will put, take the sleep away from you so that you can what? Read the Bible. Sometimes trouble comes, winds come, and it causes you what? Pray. You allow family, friends, jobs, and your own desires to come between you and your relationship with God. You allow family, my house family, friends, my house friends, and here's the big one, job, say job. That's the big one. You can deal with family things, you don't have to deal with friends, but the job, so you got to be here on Sunday. The job, so you got to work six days a week. Job, so you got 12 days, uh, 12 hours a day. So what has that involved? Job. And you kind of manage the job, and you do work that you're not going to like doing anything but rest. So that big one here is the job. He's like, I gotta work. Yeah, I'm gonna gotta work. But it had to come to you know, I, I want a job, and there was another girl who was hiring, and back then, the big Jerry said, I would say, hey, but I didn't work him up. That's okay. That was a job with the, with the, the, the guy company, uh, all day long, one of the companies. He said, that's not a good idea selling cigarettes. That's okay. I didn't take those jobs. And by, my, by me not taking those jobs, God blessed me exceedingly abundantly more by putting God first. So we think we get ahead where we do a few jobs, not spending time with God, but that J-O-B, just overbroke, whatever it means. Look at David say, J O B, just overbroke. That's what the job is, just overbroke. <laughs> trading, trading uh, uh, hours for money. Trading hours for money. I'll give you some hours, you give me so much money, right? But at the end of the day, you made a lot of money, but then the taxes got most of the money. Then you're upset because you spend all the time at work and you, you pay more taxes than you got. You, you pay the money more than you were to pay for the All the time the government gets. And then you don't have a lot of write offs, and then you, you, you got to pay the So, anywhere you go, 
Jealous of the world. Job, jealous of the world. So if you give God your time, spend time with Him, He'll take care of God. He'll bless you. I found out that you know you can't be too, you can't bless yourself. So the first thing is you allow family to get in your way of church. You let friends get in your way of church and the big one, your job. And then your own desire between you and your relationship with Christ or God. Your desires to come between you and your relationship with God. We allow it. We allow it. Amen, somebody. There is just an intimacy in our relationship with God. So you, 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 leave, you live out the part of loving God, sharing with God, intimacy part of it, where you take time with God. In, in your intimacy means you take time, you deliver in your relationship. You deliver your, your, your time. You know, when you were young or dating, and you would fall asleep on the telephone talking to your friend. Talk so long at night. The phone, bring up the phone, lay on the chest. So all that time, talk. Amen. What's wrong with talking to God like that? Be false. You got an intimacy with him. You got to be close to him. You got to love him. You got to share him. You are caught in a cycle of dead works. You are caught in the cycle of dead works. Cycle. Let's keep on coming. Keep on coming. One cycle. Get out of this cycle. That another cycle. Get that cycle. Get this cycle. Kids have a problem. Family problems. Job problems. Church problems. Relationship problems. It's a cycle of things. We call it what? Tribulation. You are more tolerant of sin. You begin, we used to be against things, and you, well, it ain't so bad. Everybody else is doing it. Nothing happened to them. They still drive and get caught off, and I just want a good job. Nothing happened to them. So, why well, I got to be so holy than thou were always saying, or so righteous. See, the enemy knows how to play you. He plays you like a bass drum. He plays us. Plays with our emotions. Plays with our feelings. He plays with us all the time. He talks to us. You're young. You're attractive. But you didn't see that. He plays with your emotions. He talks to you like a man. But God always said, wait. 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 But we fight, wait. Because we said, wait, it's taking too long. What happened to Abraham and Sarah? What happened is they start to wait. Be patient. But they they turn to help God. They don't want to wait. We need a child now. We want to stop right now. And as soon as Hagar had the child, then she became jealous because Abraham spent more time with the child. So he spent more time with the child, and he spent more time with the mother. Right? Right? Her got younger, more attractive. His wife was older than he was But see, they created a hostile situation. Hostile. It was hostile. Two women with one man, with other women he was dealing with, but this, she had a child by Abraham. Her womb was barren. So she had a dilemma. I can't take much of this. I can't take much of this. And that's the point. She got angry. You were alright at first. But angry, that was a look at here. You ain't no good. You can't have a baby. 
Look at Hagar. She had a pretty big plan with the baby. Look at him. And, the, and, and she began to torn her. Hagar began to torn her because she had no child. So the devil will torment you, saints, and tell you what you're not. Tell you what you can't be. And what do we do about it? We go along with it, don't we? We go along with it. We yell on it. You know my heart. But after a while, I'm happy. It all falls apart. So, she was torn to her, so she put out. She got to go. So she put out. And by Abraham disobeying God, then Hagar was crying in the desert. And God came to her and brought water in the midst of the desert. And that became, and that became the nation that all the Palestine. The, the Muslim came out of that. A different race came out of that. But they said Abraham brought father as well as your father did there. So then you got conflict that going on. Those are two brothers, children fighting. They're the sinners. But they're right. So they said, we got a right to foul sign as well as you. It was my father as well as you. So they're fighting all these years. They're fighting because one man made a mistake. It caused the whole, the whole nation to go and to turn off. That's what's going on right as of today. They're fighting. You are no longer have burning passion for the laws. That's all. You got to see in Greece where they had these buses. Uh, a certain preacher, where I'm going to preach it, and got these buses, and he's riding around, and I don't know what his purpose is. He did it before, he's doing it again. But see, people have a burning desire, they have no longer a burning desire for the past of the laws. We've got that preacher that turns the politicians. They're, they're, they're politicians instead of spiritual leaders. They lost the passion for the laws. They're not concerned about the laws anymore. They, they got buses and buses. Not to, get, to pick the laws up and carry them. Say, hey, they're not using these buses to bring people to the house of God. They use these buses for political reason or political gain. That's not the purpose. You don't need a power to receive if you're not going to use the kingdom of God. To bring money in. The purpose is to separate uh, governments from the, the church and states to be separated. We don't need to be in a political realm. We need to be working with souls. At the end of the day, souls are all God's concerned about. I don't care when you can a president or governor or mayor. God's not concerned about that. What have, what have you done for the poor? The laws, the downtrodden. And we put that much emphasis and power in salvation of the laws. Be a little God for spend. Put your smart agenda. Be a little God Government races, Congress, and Senate. Be a little God And here's your. Uh, 1% of the foreign most of the wealth in America. 1%. All these billionaires. Three and four hundred billion dollars. And you got people uh, living from hand to mouth. But Jesus said the first, you no longer have a burning passion for the laws. How many of you see on TV that part of my laws? They're preaching and preaching. And say, look, we got books for sale, we got tape for sale, we got water for sale, we got hankies for sale, we got scarves on your head, 
Heard something from Satan. They took everything. Food, survival kit, everything. Ain't nothing going to about the loss. Nothing. Spending millions of dollars, millions of dollars at a time. How many wells do you hear in Africa? You must hear a three to four years about wells. Every well in Africa should be real. Go to Haiti, during the well. He was just off the wall. I don't get it. Don't get it. Your work were motivated by intense love and devotion for the Lord. Compare your love for the Lord today with what it was then. Has your love grown deeper or has it lost its favor? Are your works motivated by a passion, love, passionate love for God, or are you doing them merely out of a sense of duty? Ask the Lord to give you from leaving your first love. Begin to do your work first, to do your first work again. Make a new commitment to the base of prayer, worship, and the word. Fan the flames of dying embers of your first love through renewing the communion with the Lord. This fervent love is required of all those who belong to the Lord. Jesus called this the first and greatest commandment. The first and great, the greatest commandment. We have lost our favor. Are your, are your works motivated by passion, passion love of God, or are you doing them merely out of a sense of duty? That's why people on Sunday morning, that's why we're not going to change. They want to go out, we want to serve at 7 o'clock in the morning. So we can get out of bed. Hey, is this, this out of duty? You want to make a time of convenience so you can go about your daily, what do you do every day? Golfing and fishing and hunting. You, you know, you, you just go because I, I feel like I got my duty to go to church. That's all I'm going to do at 7 o'clock in the morning. I go to 8 o'clock in the morning. And, and all day. So we all saw a sense of duty to Christ. We want everything to fit in out around us. We want to live six days the way we want to. We get a man five days. Saturday we get a house clean up to six days. And on the seventh day, we say, well, I get about an hour. And, and early in the morning. So, you know, and then they come to church with shorts on, blue jeans on. Just like they go into a social club or go into play. It's no, no reverence anymore. It's, it's all the most, but they don't, they prepare for a football game or basketball game. They go out and buy food and drinks and everything else. They prepare all week for, for what they call them part of the hell. Football, body, whatever, basketball, whatever. And everybody go to everybody's house and eat and drink and holler about a game. But come to church and they're just as quiet as a mouse. And get mad at the preacher stay too long. But watch it. I watched the Dallas football game Sunday. How many hours was that? They played three days. Three hours, right? And nobody moved. I didn't move. Everybody sat there and watched that game all the way through. And fussed all the way through. That's a bad call. That call went right. Rev did be killed. He had a good ball left. Right? Amen. Come to church, we get better. Shoot, I don't want to be here. I mean, you know, what do you love God? My team is this, my team. I had nobody like, say, my Jesus, all I need. Where's that? I had three say, you know, I'm a, I'm a this man, I'm a that man. My fan is Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm stupid, right? I know I am. But, you know, I put more confidence in my law. It's, I, I just go out and live in a game, but I'm telling you, nothing can come before. Jesus is my first love. Maybe I'm stupid, but that's me. 
I did Psalm number 20. But I feel like God saved me and brought me out of sin. He's the best one I ever knew. He's the best. He never lost a game. He never lost anything. He's a winner. You can count on him. He never failed. Hallelujah. You just feel for that. Yeah, I'm going for that. You got the last sports, too. Amen. Sometimes they fall all the way down to the depth of the game. Get so excited, leaning over the rail, finish that. That's what you say about the game. But what about when it comes to the Lord? He don't have that same prayer to God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Matthew 22, 37, 30. He said, How can I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind? How can I do that? Where I have any space or anything else? All we are. But what are the what are the names like? Tell me what that means. That means I just to love my wife with all my love, all my soul, and all my mind. And that means I don't have I don't have anything left for anyone else. But what happens in that relationship? I learned to deal with other things that's secondary to my first love. Remember, he said his first love, right? So the secondary thing you'll go is what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. So I gave God all that I had. That's my first obligation. That's what you speak about. Your first obligation. You know you need the other things, but your first obligation is, okay, I, I'm not going to the beach this weekend because I got to commit at church. I'll go for the week or even uh, cut out some time, but my first obligation, it was many years, my wife had to take a vacation. Men had to go to the week. It was cheaper too. We get it more expensive. Or for the one time, it's cheaper, right? PC is more expensive. So, we, we, it, it is so difficult that people say, well, I, I got it. But you know, when I go out on a Monday and a Tuesday, and we been out, the place is going to be came back on Friday. I had the best time. Because you didn't have that drunk crowd. That crazy ride crowd out there. Traffic is jam packed over me. We think you want to run people hard to get around. But that's I don't know how to get them. But there's so many people on another mile. Or a little beach. People everywhere. See old folks like us are retired. So they go the baby room is retired. And the baby room is everywhere now. Why is that? Because that age group was so large that now they're retired. The house is full all day. You took time, you know, you be sitting in the car, right? You probably call them to work, we already know. But even when I was traveling. But I'm saying that I had to make my cars. And this year, someone said, you, you stop traveling so much on Sundays. Well, I said, I got to work this week, so look, keep doing it. They had to get me crazy. So I, I, I started adjusting my schedule. I started adjusting, I would leave out, I would fly out. On Sunday evenings, after service. And God bless me, they don't read it. And he honored me. And I was able to retire at 58, 56. I was very young, I was 56, I think. But anyway, he allowed me to retire early for full benefits and other things because I obeyed the man of God. See, it'll pay off, saints. You might not understand it, but the man of God, God speaks to the man of God. He speaks over you. And I see so many people, they start going well and take on more and more and more. I tell 
My sons, look, you're working too much, you gotta give God some time. Why don't think we're gonna give each other to God some time? It, it's not the only excuse. You don't have to be at church six hours. You go to church, you can spend an hour in church. I've seen how such a lady going to work in his uniform. I've seen how Rob's going to have some new uniform. I've seen some son, some son get preach, come here and preach, take a truck park outside, put his clothes on the door. If you call out some time for God, he'll bless you. And see, when you do, you set an example for other folks to follow. I know some job requires you to work Sundays, but then we have ways now if you don't come to Bible study. When you could. So, you know, God judges us, say, and then when things are happening out of ordinary, we wonder what's going on now. Amen. The worst thing in all the world would be to have war close to the come. And because of compromise and worldliness, lost out with God. Lost out with God. You did everything you wanted to become wise, you became worldly and lost out with God. I see that all the time. I don't say anything. I see you come to church. They ain't you know, they might in church. Look, they, they might ain't in church long. They look for sister too. They can care less about being in church. I know. Because the spirit will be will agree with my spirit. I can tell, just like a mother, I can tell when a child lies. Father can tell. They can sense it before they open their mouth. They can sense it. Because the Spirit will be the truth. This I have truth. So, you don't say a word, but the Spirit. When we were warned and said, danger ahead, slow down, it's a curve, it's danger, it's a BC field, it's danger, it's a railroad track, danger, stop sign, danger, red light. What is, what is a, 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 a red light for somebody like that? What, what else? Keep you from running into somebody. That's a perfect red light. Keep you, it's, a, it's warning. Yell at me what cautious. Be cautious. And what's the next line? Wait a minute. Stop. Because you got people coming. You're going to run into somebody. And people are red light now. Boom. What happens to the second? They, they got a chorus box in. The chorus is on. So the line is on. And then you got the red light, then you keep on going, bang! Trouble. Then see it is. I didn't know it come on summer, but you should have stopped. Amen? So the Lord saying to us, stop, take it easy. And because the come out of the world, we lost our God. Read it, we read in this verse. If this is the condition of you all, you all, what do you say? Your church. What do you say? Big bold letters, repent. Jesus, having said this one thing, that he was against him, going immediately back. To praise him as we see in the very next verse. Revelation is really dealing with the same heart center. Because people today, everywhere you see them, TV people are playing with God, playing with church, mocking and preaching, shouting, only 
Here is Clown. I call him Clown. Jumping, running, kind of seen of the world. You're not fooling anything to act like that. My God is not an angry God. He's a God of all. I'm not going to be clowning and jumping. I don't care how excited I am. I have to go to a place, a private place, to give God's praise. I'm not going to show the world and what they're doing to me. Blasphemy is explaining spiritual things to the world. You're blaspheming against God. This is how the saints are. This is how the saints are done. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And people don't realize what they're doing. It's a dangerous thing. You don't demonstrate what's happening out of God to the world making fun of it. You make a mark out of God. You think he doesn't see you? And people are laughing and adjusting about certain things, you know what I'm saying? And this is how it's being done. This is how it's being done. That's, that's blasphemy. Don't get caught in that foolishness. This spiritual leader hates evil. Note that this leader seems to do as the scripture suggests. And tries the spirit to see whether they are of God or not. He is trying the spirit to see the of God or not. This church does not just accept everyone who says he is a boss. Y'all got that? Don't you accept everyone that said they are what? All you see now are all these apostles. They, they got no the apostles in the hand of the Bible. <laughs> Why judge the message before they accept the apostle? It seems that this church is well grounded in the Word. This church, the physical church, has one of the oldest church founded by Paul and nurtured by Timothy, this physical church of Ephesus was located in a busy city. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hold on. We, we did. Why do you want that? Well, we just revealing it? No, I, 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 I did. I, I'm sorry. I was wrong, baby. It got so good, I didn't want to stop. Because it's true. How many churches today are lifeless? That's what we're supposed to be, right? Revelation 2 and 6. Let's see where we at now. That was fast, Oh, 2 and 6, yeah. I'm going to pass. Take on myself here. I got to mark. That's the last page, too. But this has thou that has the deeds of Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice here that Jesus, as this church, hate the sins and not the sinner. The deeds are hated, not the door. There's, there seems to be no reason for Nicolaitans except for this mentioned here. It is possible to hate evil and still not be living a pleasing life in God's sight. Worldliness is sometimes something we must not, we must avoid entirely. Someone explain to me what, what the word worldliness means. In your mind, what the worldliness means. Worldliness. What else? You take on the character of the world. You take on the character of the world. Okay, see, I can wear makeup, 
I can wear earrings. I can wear my hat if I want to be. I'm still safe. Dress up to your neighbor. Everything hanging out. But I can wear what I want to wear and I can still be safe. That's worldliness. That's worldliness. Dress in modest apparel. You still go to church, but you got a worldliness character. And say, keep on telling me what I can and cannot do. Spirit of worldliness. Out of control. Completely out of control. Red light. <coughs> what does red light mean, Brother Raphael? They have a they have this red light, what do you call it? What y'all call it in school? You walk somewhere, they say red light, you gotta stop, right? And then green light, you can go over this says red light, what do you mean? Stop. stop. I know, I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> but what, the, what I'm saying, say, that's what he's talking about. Read that right there. That's what he's talking about. You got the character of the world. You doing what you want to do. You go into church, but you look just like the world of them. There's no difference. <coughs> they got to run over you and put a sheet on your legs. <laughs> now if you have to put a sheet on your legs, they're going to show you your chest. <laughs> <laughs> everything hanging out there. Ain't nothing, go ain't nothing, everything all right. Worldliness. Worldliness. Well, well. Ain't nothing wrong with it, no. If that's what you want to wear, go ahead, sister. I'm not going to fight with you with that. God will deal with that. God will deal with all that stuff. It's the same thing you don't wear in the house of God. You can wear it to work or whatever. I've seen uh, ladies at the spirit church, they, they work in the old band. It doesn't bother me because they're working. But when they come to church, they have on dress and they look nice. But if they don't want to wear it, I think it's, it's appropriate. When we worked at, at my job, we had to wear a shirt and tie. You can wear a plaid and all that crazy looking stuff. You had to be modest apparel. You came in, white shirt, nice jacket, whatever. Khaki pants, blue jacket, whatever. But a suit or whatever. But I was in a different vein of the business, so I, I had my suits made for me to fit me because I want to look like I'm selling you a $100,000 car. I want you to see me look, it wasn't for me, but it was the image I was trying to project. So we have images in the world, corporate world, or business world, you have an image. Look across, I mean, nurses used to wear a white uniform, right? And I don't think they wear that anymore now, but they have a uniform, right? Yeah, that's something that says, I'm a nurse. You can't walk around and, and don't look like a nurse. You gotta have something, right? So as a saint, you should wanna have something on to represent your child of God. Would y'all agree? So you have to, don't worry about what people say. Don't worry about what people do. You need to, in your mind, you need to know what you're dealing with. Yes, I, 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 I wear this, you want to wear shorts, that's your business, wear shorts. But when you're in church, don't bring those shorts to church. Wear a dress, wear some things. Because you represent the right. I'm trying to get people saved. If I'm trying to live with the boys, and, and they, uh, they're not saved. I'm saying, well, I gotta go out there and get with them and try to get them saved. They drink, I'm drinking. I, how can I get them saved? I'm gonna say, what the they doing? <laughs> so you can't, you can't, you can't turn it on, turn it off. You, you either saved or you're not saved. Amen. But see, you have to show an image what it looks like to be a saint. You can't look one way and act another way. You can have suit on all you want, brother. But if you don't act like you're a saint and treat people like they're nothing, it don't mean anything. You just a man with a suit on, or a woman with a dress on. The character is the point. The character that they do. That's what worldly character. That's what you gotta have. Worldly character. But see, here's the whole thing that he's saying. I love this right here. I always go back to the prodigal son. That's my whole testimony in life. Where the prodigal son is now. 
He started in here. He winded up around here. But he, he realized he was out of place. He realized he was where he should be. And then he thought about what his father that was back home. Right? He got himself together. And he went back to his father. He said, Father, I don't want to be your son. I want to be as a high servant. Amen. When you are a sinner and God saved you, you don't go around condemning other folk because you are out of the mark of the mark. You are here and you experience what it means to be in the mark of the mark. And you say, Lord, have compassion on my brother, my sister. Because I've been there. I know how hard it was for me to get back there. I know how hard it was for me to get out of sin. And I understand what they're going through. It's not easy. It's sorry to tell you how difficult it was. But this thing was so difficult. This man, he was so he was so in, in, in dark and sin that he was at the trough of a pig stop, fit to eat slop that was there for the hogs. Maggots and flies and all the worst things. Being a Jew, they don't want to be around uh, uh, swine. But sin will bring you so low. But once you come out of sin, you should have compassion for those that are still in sin. Somebody give a hand. That's what the church like in, and that's what the Bible is dealing with. Folks that don't have mercy. That man had mercy for his son and said, you don't have to be as a high son. You are my son. Even before he saw his son coming, had that home, had access to him. He said, go kill the fattest cat. Go get a robe and put on his And also get a ring where you had to put on his shoe. See, God doesn't see sin like we see. We see sin like the strong boy. Get rid of him. But God said, not yet. I got some work in them. I got something for them to do. I see some good in them. You and I can see good in them, but I can see the good. And say, so I thank God for grace. Somebody give God for grace in the time. The Columbus. And Bellum are in the same category, probably evil and no certain roots. Christian, feed them from the moral law. They believe that adultery and first thing would not be helpful against them because they had been set free by God. Some of the liberalism we see in the church today stem from the very belief. Same thing. Same or different thing. Where they was treat folks is the way we treat people. We hide behind the cross. We hide behind the blood of Jesus. We hide, but you can't hide from Christ. You can propaganda all you want in church. You can play hard in the church, but it's how you treat me. It's how I treat you. He said, love your neighbor as your what? Self. A lot of folks left church and said, well, I got church hurt. Probably so. Because you got some ungodly folks in the church, running the church. You got ungodly preachers, ungodly missionaries, ungodly deacons, ungodly choir, choirs, musicians. The church is full of sin. But it's about God's grace. That's what I'm saying. Glory to God, my child, I'm there. Because I know where I was. And I know God reached way down like something would pull me out of the church. I know I wasn't fit to go to heaven. Hallelujah. But I thank God for grace. I want you to see this in the vain saints of how God sees it. How God will look at it. He loves the sinner. He don't love his sins, but he loves the sinner. He loves us so much he died. The six to ninth hour. Ninth to sixth hour. He died. He died for you and I. He hung on that cross. He could have come down, but he stayed there for your sins and my sins. 
Can't you see him hanging on a cross with you? We couldn't hang on a cross for ourselves. But he shed his blood that we may have the right to a tree of life. I don't want everybody that I know to be saved. I don't want nobody to go to hell, saints. God can save your enemies. God can save one of them and be through mistreatment. But don't you ever feel like that you don't deserve, that you deserve to be saved. None of us deserve to be saved. But it's by his amazing grace. I really want y'all to look at this thing, saints. I want you to look at this thing deep and long in your heart. And when you come out of that deep and lonely thought, you'll be more compassionate you, like the prophet's son's father. You, you, you're a changed person when you come out of that, that place that you're in. I thank God today for salvation. Most of all, I thank God for forgiveness. I thank you for forgiveness, saints. I really, I'm serious. I thank you for forgiveness. I don't have no business of my own. I can't brag about nothing. I know God all the way. Every step of the way. Keeps him all the way. All oh, God. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Let those hands and begin to worship the Lord. Just begin to just begin to, uh, just begin to worship. Uh, just imagine you standing before just God. And He began to show you everything you have done. He began to show you everything. Hallelujah. And then we began to thank God. I thank you. I thank you. I could have died in my sins. I could have been dead, buried in the grave on my way to a burning hill. But you, but God, saw my needs. Yeah, but hallelujah. He saw my shortcomings. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. Time to reflect. Could have been, should have been. But the mercy of God. That I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm looking for those who are not saved to tell them about this grace of God that I serve. This grace and loving God. Hallelujah. He's still saving. He's still delivering. He's still saving those that's near his hell right now. He's saving the life. He's saving the homeowner. He saved the prostitute. He saved those that feel like they're not worthy. He is saving today. And Lord, let your blood cover us right now. This whole congregation, let us feel your anointing and your presence. In the name of this mighty God, hallelujah. Come on, stand. Come on, stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Which is in the midst of 
the paradise of God. We all have ears, but this is speaking of that inner ear of the heart that receives the truth. Note there, let me note here that the spirit is capitalized, meaning God's spirit. This is not just any spirit, but the Holy Spirit of God. We also see here that he is speaking to the church and suddenly jump in, jumps to the individuals in the church when he says, to him that overcome, according to John's own definition, to be an overcomer is to be a Christian. First John 5 and 4. We are not saved uh, collectively, but individually. We are we as individuals must decide who decide who we will follow. We note note here also that there is something to overcome. We must overcome lustful temptation of the flesh. All believers in Jesus will eat of the tree of life. Jesus is a tree of life. Truly is enjoy the promises of heaven. 22 and 22, Genesis 2 and 9. God is, spirit, is a spirit. Jesus is a spirit who is housed in the body for his stay on earth. We are spirit as well as housed in this in a body. If we, can't, if we are a believer, our spirit will immediately go to heaven when we leave our body. The body will rise at the resurrection and enjoy our spirit. The tree of life is in heaven. Paradise is the garden in heaven. This is the heavenly restoration of the garden of Eden. The heavenly beings even more wonderful. Next week will be in our, our test on the back of this page. We have 33 questions. We praise God for what He is doing. Praise God for the reality of the truth. And say that God will help me. And we will humble ourselves. We can feel this going up. Just humble yourself. Don't be heavy and high minded, but lovers of God. Amen. If you love Him and love His people, you'll see God work miracles. That's all I'm saying. Anybody expects a prayer? Anybody expects a prayer?